Okay, welcome everyone to the, the last presentation of the day. And uh, we're going to be, um, again, looking at the chronology, not the chronology of the judges, but the line of the judges. And Stephen has not yet gone into the chronology of the judges, which he's going to. Um, so some of these things that we're presenting here, uh, we're, we, we need to have that chronological basis to understand uh, the significance of some of these things and the symbols as they apply uh, to this movement. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful. Grateful for your blessing and your care that we were, are able to present these messages, that we can come together and receive the fellowship of your Holy Spirit that unites us with Christ and with one another. We ask, Lord, now that as we open your word, as we look at the scriptures, that you can help us to understand uh, these things that we are studying, that we are reading, we know that all minds are not the same. That uh, for some people, uh, numbers are easy to memorize and to see the patterns. And for others, it's not the case. But yet you've given to each of us a gift to perceive details of your truth that relate to our lives. And we need one another. So we ask that your Holy Spirit can unite us. Be with us in our conversations and all that we do, and be with us now that we may glorify your name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you get my Bible for me, please? <clears throat> so back in May of 2022, we were doing this study on the law on uh, Understanding the Lines, and the study of Understanding the Lines was, um, we started at the beginning of the Bible, so what we were doing was like this, the prophetic chain, this is something that um, Elder Jeff had presented in Oklahoma in 2010, uh, the first time I met him was no November 7th, 2010, and um, which was his birthday. And I arrived there, and um, this was the topic, this prophetic chain, something I hadn't heard of. I didn't know anything about this movement, really, except that there was some number that they were looking at, which later I found was the 2520, and then I'd looked at it a little bit before um, I'd gone to the camp meeting there. Um, now, uh, what was my point? <laughs> oh, Yes, so um, we had started to study this understanding of the lines to go back to this prophetic chain. And, and what he had done is he had used this 3-1 combination. So he would look at how these events, these different lines, in each of these histories were connected. Now, as we developed an understanding of the lines, we came to understand that... Um, a line is represented by a progressive destruction of four. So this isn't actually in my notes, but this, I probably should have put it in there. And, and the first line that we addressed was Genesis chapter 1. And Genesis chapter 1 has six days of creation and the seventh. So it has seven waymarks. Each of the days of creation is a waymark. But preceding that is a period of darkness. And in every reform line, we have a period of darkness. And then you have a time of the end. In Genesis, it's the time of the beginning, right? But it is uh, a reform line. And so we had studied these reform lines. We didn't really address the progressive destruction of four in detail regarding uh, before the creation of the world. But... As we went through these lines, we would see there's this structure. 
And so what we did is we believed that there is a structure of this whole big line. And that is we can go from uh, the new earth and here we go from creation. And that there are just as there is in any reform line. So we, we zoomed into the creation of the world and we saw the pattern. And that pattern is the seven days of creation. And, and the first three days represent the first angel's message. It's arrival, formalization, and empowerment. And the next three days represent the second angel's message. It's arrival, formalization, and empowerment. And then the seventh is the arrival of the third message. And so we, we analyze that days of creation. But we know that the days of creation also represent the period of Earth's history. Now, often we talk about the 6,000 years, right? So you got 6,000 here, and then you have 1,000, the millennium, right? And then you get the new Earth. So there is... Now, we're not saying that each of the thousand years represents a waymark. It's not divided in that way. But there are seven waymarks in this line. And so that is the pattern that's been given in God's word. So that's when we were trying to uh, create this, what we did is we ended up with seven waymarks, and I'm not going to go into detail on them. Uh, but then we could zoom into each of these waymarks and we would see another line. So, for instance, if you're going to take a waymark like the flood, so you're going to have the flood, it's going to be one of the waymarks on this line. Obviously, it has to be. But we can zoom into the story of the flood and we can have a line, right? The line of the flood. And, and we found this through all of this. You know, when we go to Abraham, you know, the, the history of ancient Israel, that's going to be a line, a way mark on this line of the history of the earth. But when we zoom into that, we're going to see all of these other lines. So we're going to see all the way from, you know, Abraham coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, you know, to, uh, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem. That's going to be ancient Israel. But we can zoom in and we can see that each of that, if we draw out that line, each of those waymarks is now another line. So this fractalization, this is zooming into a, a mathematical fractal. If you zoom in, it looks the same as the bigger one. And you zoom in, and it's still the same. And you zoom in, it's still the same. Right? So this is what God has shown us, is there is this pattern. Now this pattern was first seen in Millerite history. So when we first started to draw a line, the line was just simply the line of Millerite history. It was the seven thunders, these seven waymarks. And then we started to see, well, those waymarks exist in our history and in other histories as well, that we could look at whatever story it was in the Bible, we could see the same line, that there's going to be a period of darkness, a time of the end, and then, you know, at the time of the end, you're going to have a message arrives. First, it's a messenger arrives. And then there's going to be an increase of knowledge. And then that message that messenger has is going to be formalized or given in some way. And then some event happens uh, that empowers it. And in between that, there's going to be the work of the enemies. So when the message is formalized, the enemies start to uh, fight, fight against that. And you're going to see, like, in the story of the, the three decrees... Uh, the work of the enemies is trying to stop the building of the temple because the darkness is, the temple has been destroyed and they've been in captivity. And so we could draw each of these lines and there's thousands and thousands of lines. But what we have done in the line of the judges, so in May of 2022, we noticed something that helped us to to recognize that the book of Judges could be applied to our movement at the present time. That doesn't mean that the story of the book of Judges is meant only to apply to our movement. We can, we can take an application of the Judges and apply it to 
the, to Adventism in general or to the history of the Christian church. But what God wanted us to see in May of 2022 is that we needed light for our feet and we could take this story and we noticed something, we noticed some symbols that helped us to place the book of Judges. And we had first started actually with the end of the book of Judges, pretty much, because the end of the book of Judges is actually stories that happened before the rest of the book of Judges. It's this period when there is no, uh, uh, you know, it's after the death of Joshua and there's all the disorder, when there's no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And then we're going to have um, Kushan Rishathayim. He's an oppressor. He's going to come along. And then we get the first of the judges, Othniel, right? So, and we're going to look at that tomorrow. We're going to look at that line. But for now, I want you to see what we did, what we recognized uh, with what we call the judges line. That is, we could take, we could see that in Judges chapter 2, that this was talking about our history from 9-11 to 2023. And so this was a revelation. That is, it wasn't an intellectual um, exercise. It was just something that was given to us. I was, I was shown that, that that's what we can do. And so we started with this premise that what we were shown would work. And it, it, and it surprised me to no end of how God could take this idea, which just seemed to come out of nowhere, and build this entire understanding that's witnessed to multiple ways in the book of Judges that's talking about what we are going through right now. So remember, in the last presentation, I talked about passing over the ground of fulfilled prophecy. So the idea is that when we're walking through fulfilled prophecy, we're walking along and we start to we recognize a way mark has arrived, that way mark will shine light back on past events. Right? So it's going to reflect back to the past and those past events will shine forward in front of us. This is the, the way that I understand what Ellen White was saying. And she's using it really in context of the cross. When, if you read the context, it's what, what happened when Jesus died on the cross, that's reflecting on, back onto all of these past histories that are typifying Christ. And then they're shining forward uh, to our history so we can tie uh, the history and the time of Christ with the present. And so this, this understanding, this uh, parallel between the line of the judges and our history, our immediate history within this movement. Sometimes we, we try to move out of that and look at the Adventist church or, or different things like that. But I've tried to bring the focus back in our, in our morning studies to see that this is about this movement. This is about us right now. This is about the light before us, and it's because we're passing through these prophetic events. Now... Um, we're going to draw out this line, even though I have it in your material. And, and part of what we're doing in these studies, in what we have learned in our morning studies in understanding the lines, is how to construct the line. And so once you've, you've uh, you know, if you're going to bake some bread, let's say, gluten-free bread, and, uh, you know, the first time you, you bake it, it's, it's not going to turn out that well, right? But you start to learn how to bake that bread. And you can start to learn to substitute ingredients and change things a little bit. And so the first loaf of bread that you ever baked compared to the one you're baking today, you know, how many every years later, is going to be a much better loaf of bread. And you're going to be able to, to understand the process. First time you're just following a recipe and you have no idea really what's going on. But after a while you start to understand it. You know how, what the dough needs to feel like and all those types of things for you bed bread bakers out there. Um, but it's similar to that as we've gone through this process of constructing lines over and over. And we, it, they start to just become very natural. 
Now, some lines, as we're going to see, like the line of Samson, became very problematic, and there was a number of things that we ran into uh, with Samson. One was the moral irony of Samson's character compared to Christ, even though Samson is a type of Christ. Um, but some lines just would fall out, fall on our lap, and sometimes we would be going down a path thinking we're going to construct this line this way, and all of a sudden a symbol jumps out at us and grabs us, shakes us by the shirt collar, and says, you need to pay attention to what this symbol is, and then everything just falls into place. And so when we look at these lines that we're drawing, we know that there's imperfections in them, that not everything that we have drawn in these lines are necessarily correct. That there wasn't really the, the purpose of our study to have it, um, to think that we could understand everything because we don't see everything. But God was giving us information as we moved along through these studies, showing us that he was leading us. And this is the same for this movement. This is the same for Adventism. That's why Stephen's idea that, you know, approaching the chronology of chronologies. We know that God is giving us light and this light is the light that we need now. He doesn't give us the light that we need tomorrow. He doesn't give it to us now. He gives us the light that we need today, now. Now, sometimes he does hint at things, but their significance is going to be understood later. So what we did is we looked at Judges. So we turned to Judges chapter 2. So we, were, we had gone through Joshua, and we came to understand how to use some of these symbols. Um, but when we got to uh, Judges chapter 2, we just noticed something. And, and this sort of was the pattern when it came to understanding the book of Judges. So we understood, it says here, and the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I made you go out, go up out of Egypt and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant. Now, we have the angel of the Lord, right? And he came up from Gilgal, right? So this is, Gilgal is where the sanctuary is, right? And he's going to come to this place of weepers. Those are their weeping, sighing and crying for uh, the sins of, of God's people, right? And so we, we could see right away that this is a symbol of the mighty angel coming down, Right? Revelation 18. So, so we, we looked at this and we said, well, you know, this is chapter 2, verse 1. Can chapter 2, verse 1, represent 2001? That was, that's a question, right? So, so that, was, that was just a simple idea. And, and we were in 2022, but we had some prophecies that uh, were being used uh, that led us to this date uh, January 11th, 2023, that we weren't looking for anything to happen, but some people were. And not necessarily with that date exactly, because their structure suggested that date, but they weren't suggesting that date. So I'm not suggesting somebody was setting a date as January 11th, 2023, but the prophetic mirror gave that date. That was the logical conclusion. And so, well, we have 2023, and we looked at how many verses there are, and there are 23 verses in Judges chapter 2. And then I started reading through them um, and recognizing, well, this is, this is giving a history of our movement in these. It's not like each verse is just each year, but a group of verses tells us the period from, if we read from uh, Judges chapter 2, and we get up to verse uh, 5, it's going to give us the history of this movement from 2001 to 2005. Right? So it's, it's and, and, it, and it's a group of verses, right? It's going to be um, that whole story about really 9 11, right? That's what it's going to be talking about. And um, so that's the premise we worked on. And so we started to look at uh, this line of the judges, and it took us some time to, to understand it. First, we we needed to go through this history and look at these judges and what they did. We needed to understand judges. Now, judges, Stephen is the one who had studied the chronology of judges. When I had worked through the chronology, 
I just simply use the 480 years, and I know it fits in there. I have no idea how it fits. Right? I, I put in my structure of prophetic chronology, uh, Gerard Gertaud's um, chronology of the judges, but I didn't understand his chronology of the judges, how it worked. And I didn't really know much about judges. I mean, I know, of course, you know, you've got Gideon's 300, and you're going to have, of course, Samson in there. Uh, so there's a few little things in Deborah and Barak, a little bit understanding of that. But, you know, these are not, you know, because of JL with the spike. You know, that's why you know that story. Um, so there's little things we, we know about the book of Judges, but they kind of blur, at least for me, um, in the past. They just kind of blurred as this period of darkness of the Judges when all these crazy things happen in rebellion against God. Uh, but now we've spent a year going through the book of Judges, an hour and a half, you know, in the morning, five times a week, you start to get an understanding of what's happening in the book of Judges. But we didn't have that understanding a year ago. So we have this line. And um, so what we did is we just start with this idea that, okay, we know we have a line and we know we have seven way marks. So... I don't need that much of a line. One, two, three, four. Let's go there. Okay. So you got seven way marks, and, and we just, okay, it's one, two, three, four, five, four, five, six, seven, like any line. And we know that then this is going to be, you know, the first angel arriving, and this is going to be the uh, first angel, first angel formalized. And, and that we're going to have to take these judges and lay them out on this line in some way. And, you know, there isn't just seven judges. So we had to, we had to study that. We had to try to understand who these judges were. And we found that, well, we took 9-11 as here. And we know that this is, you know, 2023. So we're saying that that's that way, Mark. And so... This is going to be the history of this movement in this period of time. <clears throat> now, what we had decided is we put Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. Even though there's three of them, we put them as the first angel's message arriving. Now, what's the precedent for doing this? Why would we not take, you know, this is one way, Mark, this is another, this is another. Why would we just say, this is a line that is, this is this way, Mark, and, and we create a line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. But th why, why can we do this? Why can we take these three judges and put them at the, as the first angel arriving? What's the precedent? There you go. So the first angel's message contains elements of all three. It's actually, if you look at it like a seed, it contains the whole plant, right? It contains, it contains the whole line. You know, in every note, every other note exists. You know, every note is a symphony. So we have this idea that fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. The first angel's message. And we can write it as the first, second, and third angel's messages are being illustrated in the first. So that's one reason why we can do that. But when we started looking at the characteristics, we drew a line of Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. So you got Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. And, and we can look at this line and, and this line worked as a line. Now, one of the things we learned about lines is that when you zoom into a waymark, you're zooming into 9-11. And you're zooming into 9-11, in this case, as the arrival of the second angel. I'll just put the fourth angel arrives, right? So we understood that 9-11, if you look, remember the study from earlier, we had two 9-11s. One is the empowerment of the first angel, and the other is the arrival of the second. 
So we have 9-11 represents two different points or two different way marks, but it's one event, right? And then we came to understand, and we're going to see this more clearly as we go through Judges, that 11-9-19 is really a, an expansion of zooming into the arrival of the second angel at 9-11. That is, when Jeff looked at the arrival of the second angel, what he is really looking at is our history from November 9th, 2019 to December 25th, 2021. So when we had that line of the 777 days and we started to make that our line. So we had, we had this bigger line, the line of Ellen White. We had this line of the Sunday Law and we continued to zoom in and create these new lines without knowing what we were doing, right? That is, initially, we didn't understand why we were doing this. We, we came up with the idea that there was fractals and uh, Parminder took that idea and used, uh, used it uh, for his purposes. So he totally destroyed Millerite history. He created a line of our history that looked nothing like Millerite history and tried to tell us that this was how we were to understand uh, the lines. He took another idea of Jeff's, the priests, Levites, and Nethanim, made them into these separate lines, and then the line of the 144,000. But we see nothing like that in Millerite history. And so I knew there was a problem, but I didn't know what the problem was. And even though I understood some things about it, it wasn't until July 18th that my suspicions were then confirmed. That is, when that prediction failed, I understood that we were in a zoom in to another waymark. And so that's what, that's what we are, we're learning here as we do this. Now, um, so we have Othniel, Ehud, and Shamgar. We just said, okay, they're going to be the first message arriving. And then, of course, Deborah and Brack are going to be next. So they must be a formalization of this message. Now, here we have 9-11. We don't have a date for this yet. When we first did this, we didn't really know what dates we were going to place. We just knew that this represented our history, uh, but it's going to be represented by dates. So there would be dates above here, right? And then we're going to have Gideon. Now, with Gideon uh, and the 300, we had uh, Jeff make an application of Gideon. And there is, in the story of Gideon, as we're going to see, there's this separation between all these people that are called and they're going to be separated first. There's just the ones who aren't interested in fighting. They're going to be sent home. They've got all kinds of other things going on. And then you have 10,000. And then in those 10,000, they're going to go down to the water to drink. And 300 of those 10,000 are going to lift the water up to their mouths while the other 9,700 are going to lean down and drink straight from the water. And so the 300 then are selected to fight this battle against the Midianites, right? So we can see that this parallels in this movement events. So we're going to see what those events are from 9-11. And then we have, in the story of Gideon, we have, of course, his illegitimate son, Abimelech, who's going to be the first king of Israel, Right? He's going to proclaim himself king. He's going to have the, um, the men of Shechem make him king. And this is going to be a counterfeit covenant at, um, uh, in Shechem. And we're going to have a son of Gideon, Jotham, who's going to be, survive the slaughter of his uh, brothers. There's 70 sons of Gideon. And it talks about Abimelech killing them, not directly, but through men he hired. But Jotham escapes. And, and so these stories become very interesting as we start to, to place these on a line. But the question is, where do we put them? Um, so we know that Jotham's not a judge, so we didn't put him as a judge. And Abimelech's not a judge, so, so we have to put them somewhere. And, and so we, we ended up having Jotham sort of go uh, here. But he's not a judge, but his story. And his story is connected to Abimelech. Right? 
So, I mean, we could call this Jotham and Abimelech. Okay? Uh, but we have this other way mark here. There is judges, and it's the second mate message arriving, and it's going to be Tola and Jair. Now, they're not going to tell us much about them, and we're, we're going to look at that line. But Tola and Jair, I mean, uh, here you have two. And if you have two, what does that suggest? So you here you got the first angel is empowered, here you're going to have the second angel arrive. So these two represent the second angel. So we have a symbol there. But there's lots of other evidences that place them here. And then the date that we're going to place over top of where these are in our history. And then we have the story of Jephthah. So in Jephthah, this is going to be the second angel. It's going to be formalized, right? That's how we, we did this. And then we have the second angel empowered. And, and again, we have not just one person, but we have Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. Now, I'm really bad with names. Trying to remember all these names was hard, but I think I finally have it all down. And now these three are going to be the empowerment of the second angel. And then finally we have Samson. Now, the story of Samson is the most complex, and we're going to spend a couple of studies on Samson. Yeah. Thank you. I was... Don't ask me why. <laughs> I was probably thinking back to here, to Ehud and, you know... Thank you for that. Okay, so we got Elon, Abdon, Samson. Now, when we started to look at Samson, we also noticed that the story of Samson was fairly complex. And we have another thing that happens in our line, and that is we will get the fourth angel arriving. So we're going to have Samson as the third angel arriving. And that's going to be 2023. Those are the, the history of this movement. But we have this other way mark over here, and this is the story of Samson and Delilah. I think that's how you spell it. I know every time I spell it, my autocorrect changes it to the right spelling. So, yeah, uh, Delilah. Ah, that's why I always forget this I. Right. Delilah. There we go. Does that make sense? That's how it's supposed to be spelled. Okay. Now, to know what these dates are, um, we have to spend a lot of time. So, to, to prove it here right now, I can't prove what, we're get, what we have on that line, but we drew these dates. So, this is what we have. We're going to say, when we start to look at these stories, each of these stories is going to give us the events in our history that these stories describe. And so we're going to say that this is October 13th to um, September 7th, right? Is that what I have there? To September 7th? I think that's... Yeah, September 7th. Uh, this is in 2018. And this is in 2019. Okay. So this is a period of 329 days. And um, so this is representing that history in our movement. And so when we look at Deborah and Brack, we can then take this date and, and show that this story is illustrating that part of our history. And then when we look at Gideon, as I mentioned, uh, this is going to represent 11.9. Um, not 989, but 19, right? So this is going to represent that separation in the movement that happens um, specifically here, what happens after that. So that, that dividing date of 11-9. And then we have this date is represented by July 18th, 2020. 
You can see the 220s there representing a doubling. And so that there's a line then. Tola and Jair are going to have a line. Now, the other thing that I want to mention here is that when I zoom into a line, uh, I'm marking a date or here a span of time. This represented in this movement. But when you look at the line and you zoom in, that line can contain some of these other way marks in the line above. So um, when we look at a line and we zoom in, let's say we have the big line, the big line I call Ellen White's line, like we looked at earlier. And if we zoom into a way mark on Ellen White's line, we'll get a line below. And that line, we draw it out, it will contain some of the way marks on that bigger line. But then we zoom into a way mark on that line below, and we have another line below that. And some of those way marks will be shared with the line above. And we, we noticed this when we went through the, the beginning from Genesis, through the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and then uh, you know, through the history of the Exodus, and, and then Joshua. And then when we got to the judges, we had already had a grasp of how to construct these lines, how we could zoom in. But we weren't always sure what level or what magnification we were zoomed in when we looked at some of these lines initially. Right? So now we have a better idea of how to do that, is we have a structure where we can say, we're looking at this line. This line is a zoom into this way mark on this line above, which is a zoom into this way mark on this line above. Now, of course, you start to get a lot of lines because, you know, as I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. If you take that into account and you start to say, you know, the seven wives had seven sacks and the seven sacks had seven cats and the seven cats had seven kittens, right? And you start to do the math, it starts to multiply exponentially, right? And so we start to end up with more lines than it is possible for any one of us to know, right? So we can't look at every single line. But what we can look at is the lines that God is giving us to look at that are giving light to our feet. So we, we looked at Tola and Jair, and we found that that's where that way mark was. And Jephthah was going to be December 6th, uh, 2020 as well. And so we could see that this, this story illustrated this. And then December 25th. 2021. That's going to also uh, uh, be a line, Ibzan, Elan, and Abdon. And, and this, these, the way marks on these lines will be some of these same way marks. And then we have here, January 11th, 2023, is the arrival of the third angel's message. So, Again, I need to emphasize that when we're looking at these lines in the story of Judges, we're making an application. That's an application that God has given us, but we're not saying that the story of the Judges is primarily speaking about this history. Right? But it is speaking to us now about our history. And the way that this fit in is miraculous. It's not something that could be contrived. It's not something man could invent. And then we have here, and this is going to be in the week of Christ study, we have this other date that I talked about, April 5th, 2030. And we put this date here, and its significance is not to predict some event or to delay the events of Bible prophecy, saying, well, we got this date in the future, so you can rest and relax for the next seven years, you don't really need to worry. Once we get closer to 2030, then you'll you know, have to start to worry. We're not saying that at all. In fact, this date here is giving us information about our present duty, the responsibility that we have now. So I take it, we take it as a symbol of, of history. Now, when we look at this line, from 9-11, and we go all the way here, we have something very interesting. 
I'm just I put in the thing it's in the in the notes it's 354 months now there's symbols in all of these lines all of this history of judges that brings us back to the story of Ezra from chapter 7 to chapter 10 and I, I wish I had another board I could flip it over but <laughs> um, let me see I'm gonna do that that's okay. I'm just going to flip this board around. So I know that's... Uh... Yeah, that works pretty good. Okay. Now this one doesn't have the nice lines on it. Um, I'll just take this off here for now. So in the story of Ezra, and we're, we're going to look at this uh, more closely in detail. But Ezra starts, we, we know from Ezra 7, 9, where does, where does this story begin? It's going to begin, he's going to leave Babylon on the first day of the first month, right? And this touches on what Dwight did in his presentation regarding Millerite history. Because the first day of the first month in Millerite history is that beginning of that line. So we have the first day of the first month. And he's going to leave Babylon with this decree, but he's going to go to the river Ahava. And after three days... On the 12th day of the first month, he's going to leave the river Ahava, and then he's going to travel to Jerusalem, and he's going to arrive on the first day of the fifth month. And then after three days, he's going to bring the gold and silver to the temple. And then we know that the next date that's going to be mentioned is going to be the 20th day of the ninth month. That's in Ezra chapter uh, 10. They're going to repent of their, three, their strange wives. And after three days, so they get a three-day call to come to Jerusalem. And so there's going to be three days here. And then there's going to be you know, 10 days. And then there's going to be uh, from the first day of the, the 10th month, this period of the divorce to the first day of the first month. And we're, we're going to go over this a bit more detail later. Now, technically, this is 88 cardinal days because two of those months have 29 days and one of them has 30 days, so instead of being 90 days. But it can represent three months of 30, 30, 30, which we're going to see as significant in the story of the judges. Now, part of the problem that we face here with what we're presenting is that there is so much information, so much detail, so many things that we have to pay attention to. Um, and, and they're so interconnected, like the cogs in a watch. You know, all those cogs are all connected to each other, right? They're part of a machinery. That's the wheels within wheels. That timepiece that is the heavens that Ezekiel sees. The sky, God's timepiece of, of prophecy, right? Because he created the sun and the moon and the stars for times, for seasons, for days and years, for prophecy. And God is in control of the heavens. The Babylonians tried to manipulate their gods through uh, ceremonies so that they could get the stars to do what they want. Or they, and of course, the priests were just deceiving the kings because they say, well, we can do this and then, you know, this is going to happen. On this date, we will see uh, the sun darkened or we will see the moon darkened. Right? Because they could see the patterns and they would know, these astrologers, right? they were actually astronomers. Right? They're, they're astrologers too, but they were astronomers. So they knew when the lunar eclipses would occur. They would know when a solar eclipse was going to occur. They had ways of figuring this out, especially the lunar eclipses, because they happen in a pattern of 391 years. So you know if you know what happened 391 years ago uh, with the moon, you know it's going to happen again. Right? Same place, 
same time, almost exactly within, within a few minutes difference. So it's very, very powerful knowledge they had in order to manipulate the king. But that's a whole other story. The point is, here we have this line, this history, and we notice it starts on the first day of the first month, and it ends on the first day of the first month, right? And the number of days from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month in 457 BC is how many days? It's 354 days, right? That is, it's 12 lunar months of 29.530587 days in length. Um, actually, you know, if we did it in the Jewish way of counting how long a month is, it's 7654321 plus one parts of a day. And a day is 25920. Um, That's how long a day is. Right. And if you do the math on this, you'll find it comes out. Uh, they actually have it back then. The, the month was longer. It was 29.530597 days in length, 94 nine, days in length. So slightly, just a few seconds difference. It's not a huge difference. But anyway, that's, that's, that's not meant there to confuse you. It's just to me meant to understand that this period of time, if you add it up, an average year, of 12 months is 354.367, right? That's how long it is. So obviously this is slightly shorter than the average. So they have, to, and, and it's also shorter than a solar year, right? So that means you have to add a month every two or three years to get the spring to be back, the start of the year, back into, in sync with the seasons, okay? Now, it says on this chart here, um, this 354 months. Um, now, this is 354 days. But if we say that this is 9-11, and this is April 5th, 2030, 9-11 happens in a month called the sixth month, which is the month, uh, um, how, how do you say that? Well, it's a Lulu, a Lulu in Babylonian, but Elu, right? Some, something like that. The month Elu, I never really say that very loud, out loud. I usually just see it. Okay, now, so 9-11 happens on, uh, I believe it's the 21st day so day 21 of the sixth month. So it's the 21st day of the sixth month, I believe. I, I could be wrong on that one. Um, on that month. Now that month then is going to start on, so the, the, the first day of the sixth month is August 22. So August 22 in 2001 is, the first day of the sixth month is August 22. And then... 21 days later, 20 days later, 9-11 is going to happen. So we're going to call this the first month. So if you take this month, it's going to end on uh, September 22. So you have this first month. We'll call this no month number one. And then what we're going to do is we're going to count these lunar months and count 354 of them, right? So when you get to 354 months, you're going to come back to the first month again right? And, and April 5th, 2030 is the first day of the first month. And that is, the month before that is the 354th month, right? So that's the end. And so when you get a beginning of the year here, April 5th, 2030 marks 354 months from the month in which 9-11 occurs. So this means that we can take the story of Ezra and this history and we can say that it goes from the first day of the first month, 9-11. It's going to go from 9-11 all the way to April 5th, 2030, 354 months. Now we could also start on the date 9-11, but instead of counting lunar months, 
of 29.530587 days, we can count 30-day months. So that means in 354 months, I'm going to roughly get um, half as many months added to that, right? Half as many days added to that. Because this is, this is a little bit more than, um, a little bit less than a half a day difference. So, you know, it's going to, I don't know the exact number of days. I didn't figure that out to remember it. But I do know that if you start on September 11th and you count the first month as 30 days and you keep counting, you're not going to come to this date. You're going to have 354 lunar months. And then when you get to the 354th month, it's going to end in the first day of the next month is going to be in 2030. It's going to be October 8th. But it's also going to be the 10th day of the seventh month. Now, when does the 10th day of the seventh month begin a year? Like, normally the first day of the seventh month begins a year. When it's a jubilee, right? So this would be indicating this as a symbol of a jubilee. So, and we know we have two different starts of the year. We have the spring, the first day of the first month. That's where you always count the year. You never call the start of the year in the fall, the first month in the fall. It's always the seventh month. And if it's a jubilee year, it won't start on the first day of the seventh month. It starts on the 10th day of the seventh month. So this is extremely unlikely. So these are witnesses to, uh, to this structure that we have in the story of Ezra and to these lines in the book of Judges and what the book of Judges is going to do as we go through these lines is it's going to give us constant witness to this. It's going to constantly show us that what we're doing here with these lines, what we have studied right from the foundation of Adventism, Ezra 7, 9, all of these, these truths that were given to us, that they're all consistent and they all point to a work that God wants to do in our lives. It's not about predicting events. It's about God speaking to us through the scriptures to tell us something that we need to hear. And that something we need to hear is twofold or threefold, depending how you look at it. So the first is, the work of the Holy Spirit does what? He's given to what? Jesus says, I'll give you another comforter. For what purpose? Conviction of sin. Of sin? That's the first thing. We need a conviction of sin. Does studying God's word, receiving light, bring, expose what's hidden in the darkness? Yes. And that darkness is the darkness of our hearts. Right? First, right? Because if we don't see the darkness in our own hearts, can we ever give a message to anybody to get the darkness out of their hearts? No. no. We can give an intellectual message. It could even be correct. But it's only going to uh, breed what it is. It's going to be self-sufficiency and pride. And we see this with the Jews. They had lots of truths, but it was used to exalt self. And so this message is meant to abase Man, to lay the pride of man in the dust, okay? And it's going to convict us. The Holy Spirit convicts us of, of righteousness. What, what does that mean, of righteousness, convicting us of righteousness? If he can, first we get the conviction of sin, then the conviction of righteousness is what? We can say the first one's justification, and then we have sanctification, right? It's Christ's righteousness lived out in the life, okay? Does that, that make sense? And then we have judgment. Well, what is judgment? Um, Jesus says, of sin because they believe not on me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. That's the work he's going to do in the heavenly sanctuary, right? And of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. And Ellen White adds, and, and, and soon he will be cast out, right? So this is attacking the judgment is attacking who? Our adversary. Our adversary, right? He's going to be bound to the earth for a thousand years, right? He's going to then receive the punishment for the sins 
uh, those sins that were forgiven by Christ, and he's going to bear the responsibility of those sins. Christ has borne the responsibility of our sins. But who's really responsible? Is Jesus responsible for our sins? Is he the instigator of sin? Is Christ the instigator? No, Satan is. But Christ temporarily takes those sins upon him and suffers the penalty for those sins, that complete separation from God. But he's going to take, as the high priest, once he cleanses the sanctuary, he's going to take those sins and confess them upon the head of the scapegoat. And Satan will now bear his responsible for, for responsibility for the sins that he caused God's people to commit. Those sins have been blotted out and gone beforehand to judgment. Satan is not our sin bearer. Those sins have already been dealt with by Christ. But Satan then has to bear the responsibility for those sins. <clears throat> now, we can see if we flip the board back over the other way, which I won't do right now, because you've got it in your notes. Um, but that, those are the lines that we're going to judge, or judge, we're going to study in the book of Judges. Yes, Heidi, you have a question? I already know that. <laughs> My wife's trying to tell me how much time I have left, but I already know. Um, so, um, so we have this outline of Judges, and I'm just going to read... Um, Um, I'm not going to read that part. Oh, this is the part I wanted to address. This is an important point. So when we look at these judges, uh, each of these judges represents uh, a deliverer, a message, right? So this judge is a message. And why does that message have to arrive? Why do we need a message? Why, does, why do we have a line in the first place? We have what that happens before a reform line? Darkness, right? So we have a period of darkness. Now, in the book of Judges, there are these enemies that are left in the land. Now, some of these enemies are, you know, were partly destroyed but came back. Um, some of the enemies that are actually going to be internal enemies, they're not really going to be the enemies in the land at all. Some are going to be external. But God gave these, these, these enemies to oppress Israel when they had gone astray. So he allows these enemies to come. And so these enemies, they're also representing messages, right? But false messages, right? They're, they're false teachings or ideas. And so those errors have to be corrected, and they're corrected by judges, right? Those are messages. So the whole purpose of, of our understanding of these lines and its application to this movement is to understand how, first, we have departed from God in some way. There is something about us that needs to be corrected. And God is going to give a message at a specific time to address that error. And that correction is then going to lead to, uh, it's, it's all going to be in a reform line. But then once that correction occurs, we have a falling away. So you're always going to have these periods of time in which God gives us light, and then some people receive that light, some don't. And all through this line, God is developing a people, not just in this line, but throughout all history, a people that are going to stand in the time of Jacob's trouble and are going to reflect Christ's character, and they are going to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, and yet they will be like Christ. They'll have no sins to remember. Their sins have been blotted out and gone beforehand to judgment that they cannot bring them to remembrance. But yet in their life, they see no good thing. They're not depending upon themselves. This is the message that God is wanting to give us. But there are other messages that pander to our human nature. Time setting is one of them. Conspiracy theories are another. There's many things that appeal to human nature that make us feel we are better than others. But if it's a true message of God, it's going to work a work of repentance. And that's what we're studying. 
So we're not just studying about numbers. We're not just studying about chronology. These all have a purpose to show us our sins. And so that we can be converted. And so that we can give a message to others. And I don't believe that this movement is the only movement that exists within the world. I believe that people are all over the world studying and God is giving them light that then is going to be manifest where this light, the whole earth is going to be lightened with his glory. We had some people in this movement, as we're going to see when we go through Judges, who believed that this movement was so special that it did not sin, that they are without sin, and that we're going to create this perfect church and we're just going to call everybody into our church in which we would be then the leaders of that church. And of course, we know that that movement was Parminder's movement, which is a cult, a satanic cult, really. No different than Jim Jones or um, any other cult you want to name. There's probably lots of cults, but you understand what I'm saying. The people in this movement were able to be deceived to the point that they could follow man instead of God. So I hope that that helps people in understanding what we're going to study. Um, any questions? Okay. Well, let's close with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this study and for the blessing of this day. Um, for each of the messages that have been given. We know, Lord, that um, there's much to learn. And we know that we can learn if we enter into the school of Christ. That we yoke up with Christ. That we can experience His strength. That humanity and divinity combined does not commit sin. And so we want to unite with divinity through Christ. Be with us through the rest of these studies. Be with those that are searching, that are studying these things to see whether or not they are so. Help the presenters to present your words. And bless each person in the struggles that they face in their lives. Thank you for this day and for hearing our prayer. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.